elaborate a little bit about why this kind of training is so specialized, uh, what, what, what we offer to the students and why um, they've come so far, we hope, to, um, to work with us. You know, when we were in school, uh, our generation, we studied with the great generation of, of musicians from the 20th century, the Guarneri Quartet, the Juilliard Quartet, the Beaux-Arts Trio, the Vermeer Quartet, the, the greatest artists that we all know from our old records. And it was a, an unbelievable experience. The, the, the kind of learning that we did was different. It was um, slow. And it was it, a lot of it was demonstration-based. So when you studied with a master teacher, they would play something for you, and then you'd play for them. And they'd say, no. And then, and then they'd say, there, you got it. And you didn't know what you did. <laughs> and then your job was to, that week was to go deconstruct what you think you did well and come back and see if it's still held together. And I'll, I'll just give you a couple of really quick examples. So some of the words that we learn when we're musicians, we, we hear the word phrase. You have to phrase. We're told that we have to blend. And we're told we have to balance. And all of those words can, can end up meaning nothing. nothing. <laughs> when someone says you need to phrase more, you sort of feel like they've stepped on your heart, like you need to try harder. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've developed is, from the, the experience and the teaching that we got, is we've tried to extrapolate the essence of what they were teaching us, which is this law of musical inequality. So the idea of a phrase is that you have a series of notes that are unequal in some way. They either go up or go down, or they get louder, or they get softer, or they become more intense or more diffused. But they end up being like a sentence structure, like syllables and vowels and consonants. And that's how our, the human brain kind of takes in expression. The idea of balance and blend is all about in what way are we going to not be equal. So in a string quartet, what you're dealing with is a, usually a master genius composer who's also in the room who slid a problem to you. And the four of you have to solve it. And in a string quartet, there's a possibility for six duets and a mathematical possibility for four trios. And what the composer is doing is playing with the audience's sense of organization to create variety. Our job is to know who am I playing with, if it's two of us, and in what way are we not equal, so who's leading and who's following. And those, rule, those relationships are changing all the time. And so when students come to study with us, the first thing we do is try to show them how they're going to have to play their instruments differently. It's not like in an orchestra where you're dealing with bigger swaths of your bigger you know, pieces of sound that are sort of controlled this way. You're dealing with sort of microsurgery and architecture and a psychology and math and physics <laughs> and sonic chemistry. And that's what music is. It's sort of aerial chemistry. So if, if someone plays one note, you don't know whether that's a good note or a bad note until there's another note to compare it to. You don't know whether you have consonants or dissonance, stability or instability, propulsion or resistance, right? And so what we, what we try to teach them is what's on the page is sort of a blueprint for a series of decisions that they have to make in, in interacting with the composer. And so it changes the relationship the students have, and these are not students, these are young professionals, with, with each other and also with the music. And in that way, it becomes sort of this life-changing experience. So where they're looking at the music with questions and trying to get answers so that they can engage with one another. Yeah, most of the time, um, uh, a student's um, relationship to music is individual, but between them and their part, and they are trying to accomplish the tasks that are kind of laid out for them. And so uh, when they get to the point of starting to play some of this great music together, it's just such a wonderful thing to, um, uh, for us to be able to share these insights into the way things are put together. And um, one of the things that we uh, can teach them is that the quartet, uh, for instance, isn't made up of four individual parts that are being put together. But it's one musical idea that has been split into four parts. And so their job is to realize how their parts fit back together into that whole. 
and just that philosophical difference is uh, is very important and uh, can be very exciting, even uh, for these students. Even simple things like we, we take for granted sort of in human interaction. If, if you're comfortable with somebody and you go for a walk, you don't think about how you move together. But if you're unfamiliar with someone and you go for a walk, you suddenly become aware <laughs> that you're not moving the same way. And you become aware of the sidewalk and you become aware. That's one of the most difficult things to organize, is how do we actually move, move the strings at the same time in the same way? And so there's technique to that. There's, there's, there's the organization that we're talking about. And, that, and there needs to be an openness. Because one of the things that rehearsing with, I mean, we always joke that being in a string quartet is like being in a marriage with none of the benefits. Um, <laughs> do with that with what you will. Um, <laughs> But it's a, it's a relationship based on constructive criticism. There are, there's, I, I, we've been in the quartet for tw over 20 years together, and it's rare that someone says, that was so beautiful, can we just, can we hear you play that again? We don't <laughs> rehearse like that, but it's always, could you do less of this, could this be more, could you be later, could you be with, could you ch how can I change and adapt? And so there's a flexibility that they have to learn. And so this flexibility reflects their own individual relationships, our relationships with our instruments, as well as how we're playing together. So this tradition of, of sort of care and mentorship, um, what, you know, some of our favorite times, certainly when we were in school, was uh, when we were in chamber music situations, not just because we liked chamber music, but because we got this insight into the way um, the music was put together in a different way than we did in our individual lessons, where we we're trying to play better. This, in, in chamber music, you're trying to play expressively, you're trying to play with, with one another, and how do you do that? And uh, how do you achieve this? And uh, the whole process takes a lot of time, um, um, and we love to take that time with our students, uh, whether we're in Brazil or in St. Louis in, with the chamber music festival that we have here. Um, so and we, I, I, before yeah. I forget, I would just say that the festival here, the idea behind it really is to give students who don't have the means to go away mm -hmm. to have a chamber music festival. It started this right. way. That's so, right. so one of our, one of, one, some, mo half of the students that participate come from St. Louis mm -hmm. are students who can't leave, who don't, who can't afford to go to Aspen or places that cost a lot of money to go. So right. we, we try to make the festival as low cost as they can. And it's become this international festival because of our Brazil and South American connections. So the right. St. Louis kids get an international festival. And we also support these um, uh, groups to come from South America uh, because that's the way that, that the St. Louis students uh, learn about the world. Uh, and so bringing the world to St. Louis as well as bringing St. Louis to the world. The thing is that I'm going to get them. We Good. All right. <laughs> Let's bring them more.